Okay, guys. Hi, I'm Michaela. I'm the SPS Programs Coordinator. Thank you for coming to our virtual talk series. Um, today, uh, Professor Colleen Countryman from Ithaca College and Zone Counselor for Zone 2 will be giving us a talk about her design of apps for, education, for physics education resources. Um, if you guys have any questions during the talk, we're going to save them for, till the end, so please put them in the chat and we'll come back to them. Um, and for a reminder, this is being recorded, so keep everything respectful. Um, enjoy. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Michaela. Um, so yeah, I'm Colleen Countryman, and I'm from Ithaca College, as, as Michaela was kind enough to uh, announce. Um, and uh, I wanted to give you a sense of uh, what physics education research is actually all about. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of different types of physics education research, as there are um, with, with most types of physics research, right? There's basic research that, that focuses on sort of learning theory and cognition and, uh, you know, student and teacher characteristics, things like that. And there's also the applied part of physics education research that focuses more on active learning and instructional material design, teacher prep, and technologies to so sort of direct applications for the classroom. And, and so I focus primarily on uh, applied physics education research specifically as it relates to educational technologies. And, uh, and so yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, a couple of apps that I've developed or am currently developing. And, uh, and you can actually download one of them if you want to. Uh, there, it's available for free and it's called NCSU MyTech. So uh, if you haven't done that, you may want to just so that you can kind of play around with it uh, as we chat. So, um, so first off, I just wanna kind of uh, break this up into two pieces for you. So, so we're doing, um, we're gonna be talking about mobile app development as sort of a story in, in two parts. And so I'm gonna focus first on the completed app, um, which is called MyTech. I'm gonna introduce you to MyTech and, uh, and talk about how we actually designed MyTech for student learning objectives. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the impact on students because um, you know, you're not done once you've developed a product, right? You wanna actually see what the impact of that product is on your audience. And so that's what we've done there in the first half. And then in the second half, um, I'm gonna be talking about an app that is currently in the process of being developed. And so that one's not quite ready for you to, be, to, to download yet, uh, but I'll, I'd be happy, to, uh, I'll be happy to share some of uh, the details of that app. And, uh, and the, the sort of collaborative, the collaborative nature of the research group and the uh, adaptations to the study design that we had to do um, as we ran it this past week in an online classroom as opposed to a physical classroom. And then um, some of the pre preliminary results that we actually just got back in the last week. So, um, so to start things off, what I thought I would do is actually and, and this may be uh, a little scary, so uh, bear with me here as I, as I figure out the best way to do this. Um, and I hope that I am now, yeah, sharing my screen with you on my phone. So if you haven't downloaded the NCSU MyTech app, um, you should be able to, uh, to do that now. Let's see here. Oh, it was working, of course, and now, you know, when I need it to work, it does. Oh, there we go. Okay, excellent. So I'm just mirroring my screen here. And, um, and what I'm gonna do is open up the, the MyTech app. And what it does is um, it actually monitors the physical motion of the phone. And so there is an internal accelerometer inside the phone that actually, uh, that monitors the phone's movement. And it's uh, primarily used, oh, there we go. Let's see, <laughs> of course my wire doesn't work when I need it most to work. Um, but it does monitor uh, what's actually going on inside the phone. And, uh, and so you can see uh, as I move the phone that it's moving um, the, the graph, right? The graph output um, along uh, the different dimensions of the phone, right? So uh, depending on what direction, what axis that I move the phone, I actually see that movement result in a change in the acceleration of the phone um, in, inside the app. So the app is primarily meant to be used in lab classrooms where, um, where you're trying to collect data on the motion of something. So specifically, it's best for, you know, introductory physics classes uh, in a first semester, sort of a mechanics class where you might strap the phone to a cart and, uh, and, and actually visualize the motion of the cart based on the data collected by the phone itself. So, uh, so that's sort of what we're looking at. Uh, we also have a visualization. And that's the little uh, pendulum bob icon in sort of the lower left of the main screen. And so this is meant to kind of give you a sense of actually what's going on inside the phone and how it's able to um, 
to determine what the acceleration looks like um, for the phone itself. So uh, this is meant to kind of give students a better understanding of what's going on uh, inside that phone altogether. So uh, we also have a gyroscope tab. And uh, so this gives us rotational data along the three axes of the phone. So thinking about sort of the X axis going this way, the Y axis going this way, Z axis coming out of the screen at you. So you can actually determine the rotation along any of those axes. And you can record and, uh, and look at that data uh, immediately right on the phone. So, so th that's just sort of at least a brief overview of, of what my tech is, uh, is capable of doing. Um, so let me get back to, uh, to sharing my screen here with you. Um, excellent, here it is. So, um, so bringing it back, I want to give you some examples of how we've actually been able to use this. And so the phone, for example, you could attach it to um, a, a cart and push it down a track into a spring, so something kind of like this. And, uh, and you can actually collect the acceleration data of the phone as it hits the spring. So, you know, obviously from Newton's second law that acceleration and force are intimately linked. And so from that, you're able to actually determine the force that the exerts, that, that, the, uh, that the spring exerts on the phone. Um, you can also do this with like a physical pendulum lab, and this is one of my favorites to do because there's some really interesting physics involved here. Um, a physical pendulum is slightly different than a simple pendulum. A simple pendulum, all of the mass is at the bottom of the, uh, of the piece of equipment, right, of the apparatus. Um, with a physical pendulum, mass is also distributed along the length of the pendulum. So it's a little bit more complicated in terms of uh, the theory behind uh, the determining the period of the pendulum. Um, but in this case, right, you can basically set this into motion as you would any pendulum. So you, you give it some initial angle and then uh, let it bob back and forth. And because of some friction in the bearings there at the, at the top axis, um, you know, it eventually slows down to a stop. But we're able to collect um, a lot of valuable data from this. And, uh, and actually, we can determine the period of a pendulum. Uh, or we can use the period of a pendulum to determine other aspects of the pendulum, for example, the length of the pendulum or the moment of inertia of the physical pendulum. So it's, uh, it's actually quite, quite an interesting um, tool to be able to use there. Um, there are some interesting challenges that come with the physical pendulum. And, uh, and specifically, uh, there is motion along two different axes, right? There is motion along the, uh, the y direction of, of, the, of the phone. And in other words, the radial direction of, of your pendulum bob. And there's also uh, motion along the z axis of the phone as it kind of moves its way uh, in and out. So, um, so in fact, you actually end up with something that looks like two different periods, and there is something kind of uh, subtle going on here. Um, and I'm sorry, I just actually recognized that I, I've got my, my camera setting um, at, a, at a strange place here. Let me fix that for you, I'm sorry, um, so, that, uh, so that we can better see each other here. Excellent, okay, great. So, um, so then looking back at this data, we can, uh, we can actually draw out what's going on radially at the bottom of this pendulum and tangentially uh, at the bottom of this pendulum because you've actually got two different types of forces operating here, right? So uh, tangentially, right, we've got um, the tangential component of the gravitational force acting on the phone. And so you get a, a fairly simple term out of the uh, tangential acceleration. But radially, you have two different forces acting. You have, um, however you want to call this, the tension force of your physical pendulum, um, as well as the uh, radial component of your gravitational force. And so these two forces interact in such a way that you end up with a tangential velocity component as part of your radial acceleration. And so what that means is that these two equations are inextricably linked. And so you end up with a coupled differential equation. And so it's actually, um, it's actually a really interesting system to analyze. What I've done here is I've created a little simulation in vPython that, uh, that simulates what's going on with the radial uh, component of the forces, total force. And uh, the tangent, I'm sorry, the, the radial component is the blue one here and the tangential component is the red one here. And so you can actually see what's causing one to have a different 
a different period than the other. And so it's interesting to have students think about um, which is the true period of the pendulum in this case. Is it what you're getting out of the tangential component? In other words, the, the Z component on the phone or the radial component, the, uh, the Y component on the phone. So, um, so anyways, this is uh, something that I think is, is kind of fun food for thought um, and a fun experiment to do at home, especially uh, under these circumstances where you might need to do something virtually. Um, so I also wanted to kind of give you a sense of how this phone is actually capable of collecting the data. There is a tiny chip inside your phone called an accelerometer and it does exactly what it sounds like. It measures acceleration. It's no larger than um, the head of, uh, of an eraser on a pencil. It's really, really small. And there is actually a physically moving part inside that chip. And so what happens inside that chip is you have a little wobbly bit uh, a little what's called a seismic mass or a proof mass that's able to move around, right, that, that exhibits sort of the, the law, of, uh, law of inertia. And so it's able to move back and forth and it's connected sort of loosely uh, to the actual, the, 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 the housing of the phone using silica arms. And so those silica arms effectively act like a spring. And that's why um, we were able to visualize the accelerometer, what's actually collecting the data inside the phone with a simple ball and spring model. So what's neat is with this app, um, you are actually able to, uh, to, to collect data uh, and actually really valuable data. So you can use the smartphone to collect acceleration data. And, um, and then I would recommend using something like uh, some free software, for example, uh, the tracker video analysis software. A lot of people are familiar with that. It's free, it's open source. Uh, it's developed by Doug Brown, who's a professor emeritus at, at Cabrillo College. And, uh, and between those two, you get uh, incredibly rich uh, acceleration and velocity data. So you can use one to confirm the other or um, vice versa. I would not necessarily recommend using my text acceleration data to integrate backwards to find velocity because there is some drift. And that's true of any, um, any of these apps that, that are collecting acceleration data. Um, just because of uh, the way the accelerometer works, you're gonna end up with some drift and so the velocity is not quite as reliable as you'd like it to be. Um, but yeah, we were able to take the existing lab curriculum and minimally adapt it so that um, instead of using sort of traditional types of uh, uh, lab input equipment, we were able to use the phone instead. And so, um, so this is just sort of a snapshot of some of the, uh, some of the labs that we were able to do. And uh, in fact, some of these we were actually able to run remotely with the help of uh, Will Sams, who's another physics education researcher who was developing kit labs at the time. So I'd be happy to talk more about that if you're interested. But, um, but yeah, this, is, uh, this at least gives you a sense of, of um, how we were able to adapt that curriculum for students. And, um, and this is still being used, and, uh, and this is uh, widely used at NC State University, which is where um, I had the fortune of, uh, of first developing this as part of my thesis. Um, I was incredibly lucky to have a great uh, team to work with. Uh, this is the Delta team, uh, which is Distance Education and Learning Technologies team um, at, uh, at NC State. Uh, and it was composed of a lot of people that worked strictly for Delta. And then uh, the, the blue circles are sort of meant to represent people who were directly related to the physics department. And so my two uh, co-advisees or co-advisors for my uh, dissertation were Bob Beekner and Michael Paisler. They were instrumental in, in helping me. And Sam Sridhar was my grad student who, um, who worked a great deal on sort of the cultural consequences of using smartphones in labs. And so she looked at um, how using a, a smartphone in a lab might impact uh, TA's attitudes about the labs and then how that might consequently, consequentially impact um, uh, students. So in developing the app, we looked at some pre-existing apps, right, that were out there on the market. This was early on, I think in 2012 or something like that. So we downloaded some apps like um, AndroSensor and SensorLog. At the time, um, those two apps were pretty comparable in their capabilities, but one was um, aimed at Androids and one was aimed at iPhones. And, um, and we used those in our pilot testing to determine basically what was working and, and what were um, contributing to significant instructional challenges. And one of the things that we determined was that um, several of these apps 
had so many capabilities um, that you ended up with uh, sort of excess cognitive load for students. There was so much to look at that it was hard to sort of focus your attention on just the things that you needed. So we tried to streamline the user interface as much as possible, keeping introductory physics students in mind, right? Um, giving them basically only the data that they needed. And that's why our app specifically looks at um, just accelerometer and gyroscope data. So, um, you know, linear acceleration and rotational data. Um, we also noticed that students were really struggling to understand the internal axes of the phone. This is, I mean, even in theory, kind of a, a challenging concept, right, and, and somewhat abstract. You're asking introductory mechanics students to think about axes that are fixed to the phone itself, right, um, an X, a Y, and a Z axis that are fixed to a moving object. And so um, that's kind of unusual in and of itself in an in introductory physics class. And, uh, and so you want to make it really clear what those axes are. And so we tried to um, illustrate that really clearly um, inside the app so that it was obvious which axes um, were the ones that were most important. Uh, we also recognize that some of these other apps uh, did a great job of collecting data, but then outputting the data um, came in the form of basically an Excel spreadsheet, uh, what's called a CSV file. And so you could download that, you know, you'd have to email that file to yourself, download it, open it up in Excel, graph it in order to even see the, get, get a glimpse of the data that you had just collected. And so what we tried to do is, is add a, 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 add a glance data preview in, in this browse feature within the app. Um, and then finally, and I think maybe even most importantly, uh, students didn't necessarily have a clear idea of how the phone was collecting data. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about this because I, I, I think that that is something that's that's very important. We don't want to just hand students a black box and say, okay, this thing collects acceleration data. Don't worry about it. It's magic, right? Um, so instead of just giving them basically kind of a block of text uh, that describes how an accelerometer works, we gave them this ball and spring model, this visualization of how the accelerometer actually collects data. And we tried to supplement that too with some, some help articles built right into the app. This particular um, point has been underscored by multiple physics education researchers. In fact, um, one of the very first, Arnold Ahrens, who was the former president of the American Association of Physics Teachers, um, identified this idea of, um, of needing to avoid the black boxiness of our data collection mechanisms as one of the relevant modes of inquiry in physics labs. And so, um, so he, he felt strongly that students shouldn't just be able to collect data, but they should also be able to understand how they're collecting data. Um, it'll help them better troubleshoot and, and have, a, have a richer understanding um, for, for the significance of their data. And this has been further echoed uh, more recently um, by, by other physicists. Um, who have who have described the concerns that they have about the fact that phones in particular laptops um, they're sort of black boxes right i mean even our cars now you open up the hood um, and the engine is surrounded in plastic right it's actually hard to understand how the car works unless you look at one that was maybe built in the 70s or something and you can kind of get a clear understanding of what's going on inside so um so we wanted to make sure that the app still promoted curiosity and um, and that was why we added this ball and spring visualization. So we actually tested this to see, did the visualization make any difference? And so we had students use the pre-existing app, and then we asked them, well, how do you think this accelerometer is collecting data? And, um, you know, there were various uh, sort of tech jargon thrown at us, but nothing that was what I would describe as, as sort of physically significant. Uh, magic was even thrown out there as an option. Um, so instead, uh, after students used the MyTech app, right, and even though we didn't explicitly direct them towards the visualization, many of them were able to give a much more fulfilling response to how the accelerometer worked. They were able to draw, um, I think, really rich diagrams uh, about these three springs along three different axes, and, um, and they even brought in some of their physics knowledge to describe the fact that these uh, spring sensors were effectively measuring forces. Um, and so I thought that was, uh, that was really a much better way of, of sort of looking at things. We also just asked students, you know, how much did this visualization help you? And, um, and 
just based on their own self-reported data, it did seem that they agreed with the sense that this, this visualization did help them a great deal. So I want to also um, give you a, a sense for the other results that came out of this study. So in order to do that, I should talk a little bit about the study design. And, and this happened over the course of about four years. But uh, we had taken uh, lab courses of various sizes, right? We, usually you want to start small and then kind of scale up in, in, in terms of size. Um, we started with a, a control treatment. And so this was using the, the pre-existing equipment with the existing lab curriculum. So we really didn't make any changes to that. We just kept it exactly as is. And uh, students in the control treatment were using the PASCO Science Workshop interface and uh, with the accompanying PASCO sensors. And uh, students that were in the experimental treatment were using the MyTech app to collect the vast majority of their data, sometimes accompanied by something like uh, the tracker video analysis software to sort of back up some of their data. And then we gave them a whole series of different instruments to determine um, how much their understanding and attitudes changed over the course of the semester. So we gave them um, a test of understanding graphs and kinematics. That's called the TUG-K that was developed um, primarily by Bob Beekner um, back in the early 90s, actually, when, when labs were first becoming um, virtual in terms of actually just using what are called microcomputers um, it, to collect data in the lab. So we saw a lot of parallels um, between that and what, what was happening with um, mobile app development more recently. Um, so we gave them the understanding graphs in kinematics test. We gave them the, uh, the CLAS, which is the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey. And this was meant to determine basically changes in students' uh, beliefs about their uh, about physics in general and um, and basically scaled them on how expert like their beliefs were. We also gave them a couple of in house sort of diagnostics, the data collection mechanism diagnostic and the app survey. And so both of these were kind of meant to get at um, well, a students understanding of the accelerometer and the gyroscope and uh, and B uh, just any feedback that they had about how the the app might be working. We also observed them. Um, so sometimes we were physically in the class with them. Sometimes we had video uh, recordings of them. Um, and then we also did uh, temporal analyses of the video recordings. And so this is similar to, um, you know, like Cassandra Paul's research uh, with the real-time uh, instructor observation tool. Um, basically, the idea was we wanted to understand what students were doing in the classroom at all of these different times. You know, we wanted to be able to compare how much time they were on task, you know, um, using traditional equipment versus how much time they were on task using the app um, and see if there were any differences there. We also did student focus groups that were all completely voluntary and uh, as well as TA interviews just to see how much um, TA's beliefs and attitudes about the, te the technology uh, impacted our students. So I'm going to take roughly four years worth of data and I'm gonna summarize it all in one slide. So forgive me if you'd like more detail, I'm happy to go into more detail on any of these points. Um, but first off, just strictly using pre-existing apps, right? Using things like Android sensor um, or sensor log in the classroom. So before we even developed MyTech, we first saw that there was no significant difference in students' kinematic skills overall. The gains in the experimental group were roughly the same as the gains in the control group. There was no statistical, statistically significant difference there. Um, there were, however, some promising attitudinal results. We had um, small sample sizes, so it was hard to, to draw any significant conclusions. Um, but it did seem as though there were some promising uh, results in terms of students being able to make real world connections. And so students had more expert like beliefs um, regarding real world connections to physics in the group that used the phones in their labs than those that used um, the control equipment. Then after we developed MyTech and we deployed it um, to you know, the hundreds of students that were, that were taking uh, their labs, we also found a couple of additional outcomes. And the first one was that their understanding of the data collection mechanism improved drastically. So students were, were uh, much more capable of understanding how the accelerometer worked. And, 
and then actually their uh, their kinematics skills, their their understanding of graphs in kinematics, um, specifically regarding acceleration graphs, which tend to be one of the more um, abstract and more um, conceptually challenging tasks for students improved as well. So, um, so yeah, we did see some, some significant improvements um, once they used the MyTech app, which was exciting. So at this point, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to shift from talking about the work that I did at NC State with the MyTech app to what I'm actively working on right now at Ithaca College. And so um, unlike the MyTech app, which was uh, aimed at laboratory courses and, and collecting physical data inside the lab. Um, I'm currently working on developing uh, an app that would help address learning objectives regarding electric fields. So this is something that would be intended to, to primarily be used inside of a classroom where you're introducing the idea of electric fields and um, you're trying to get you're, you're you know, trying to, to have students better understand qualitatively the meaning of an electric field. And so um, one thing that, you know, you always want to start a project off by doing is uh, by identifying what the issue is, right? What's motivating the project. And uh, it is clear from, from multiple uh, PER papers that students struggle with electric fields. Um, and I can certainly speak from personal experience, both as a student and uh, as a teacher, that, that this is something that, that is really challenging, right? Um, even trying to identify in this particular picture um, what's wrong with the electric field lines that are drawn can be a real challenge, uh, you know, even to uh, professional physicists. So, so these are some challenging um, tasks. The other thing that comes as a challenge is that electric fields, because they're somewhat abstract and because we don't usually see them in real life, um, can often be conflated with other vectors like forces or um, trajectories of charged particles in um, electric field, um, in, in the region of an electric field. So there's all these different areas for confusion, right? And, um, and so we want to try to hit those um, head on with this app. Finally, uh, there's two different types of representations for electric fields. There are electric field vectors, right, um, which are sort of represented by these red lines here. And there are electric field lines, which are represented by these black curved lines. And um, certainly they're closely related. The electric field lines always run tangent to the, uh, or excuse me, the electric field vectors always run tangent to the electric field lines. Um, but in terms of their actual significance, they can vary quite a bit, right? You determine magnitude of an electric field using electric field vectors by looking at the length of the vectors. Using electric field lines, if you want to determine where the electric field is strongest, you'd instead look at where the electric field lines are most densely packed. And so um, we have these two different representations for something that is already quite abstract. And so kind of throwing this all at students, usually in a single day, can be, can be a bit of a challenge. So we wanted to clearly define our learning objectives. So uh, we, we, broadly speaking, wanted um, students to qualitatively describe the electric field everywhere due to a configuration of charges um, in terms of strength and direction. And fortunately, we're not the first people to have thought of something like this, right? There are some existing visualizations out there, um, usually made for a computer, um, not, not usually um, available uh, for mobile devices. But um, for example, there is a FET that came out of CU Boulder, specifically Michael Dobson, that, that's fantastic, um, that, uh, that gets at some of these electric field vector maps. Um, there are also, uh, there's another FET called the Electric Field Hockey. It's very engaging that Ruth Chabay created. Um, there is a flash physics simulation as well that gets at some of these ideas. But there were, there were certain aspects of those visualizations uh, that we wanted to incorporate into our app. And, and we wanted our app to specifically address the, the learning objectives that we had set out at the beginning. So, we wanted to create specifically a mobile app that dynamically displays electric field vectors and electric field lines um, with various configurations of charges. And so this was something somewhat unique to um, what we were trying to do. So we have that, we've developed this app and it is still in a prototype mode, um, but it'll be published on iOS and Android uh, using React Native and I'll talk a little bit about that um, briefly. 
we just tested this last week, and so I'll share some of the data that we have from that um, and how we were able to uh, translate the um, the real-time study that was supposed to happen in a physical classroom to our online environment. But first uh, and foremost, I want to um, just acknowledge the fantastic team that I'm, I've been working with. Um, John Barr is in computer science. His student, Yemi, um, they, they had worked together to create sort of the, um, the very first uh, versions of the Defy app and have continued to adapt it as time has gone on. And uh, my student, Liana, and I have um, been working on incorporating the physics. And so there's really a unique collaboration that's going on here um, where you have computer scientists and physicists bringing both of their talents to the table um, to try to make the most of their abilities. And so um, I wanted to just share, I'll just share a couple of screenshots of the app. The nice thing about the app is that it is dynamic. So it's constantly calculating the electric field due to, to various types of charges. And so you can actually use sliders to change the charges and um, it will automatically update the electric fields as a result of that. Um, there's also an electric field vector mode and an electric field line mode. And so um, there's a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of uh, the app's visualization capabilities. Um, my student Liana, I think, did a really nice job of kind of illustrating exactly how the learning objectives fit into various features of the app. So, um, so she's able to actually identify exactly how we were able to tie in these student learning objectives to, um, to the design elements of the app. And that's really what guided um, our, our prototype for the app. Um, what was interesting about the collaboration is that um, we we had to share uh, our ideas about how to program the actual calculation of the electric fields. And so to do that, you really have to think about how an electric field is being calculated. So if you have two different charges and you want to determine um, the electric field at some generic point, say down here, and of course, you, you guys know um, from having done this in your introductory physics classes that you would determine the electric field due to one charge, determine the electric field due to the other charge, and then add them up using vector addition, right? And so that's effectively what we're doing um, on, the, on the computer, right, using, um, using this, this JavaScript. And so, uh, so that's effectively what's going on here. We have E1 being calculated and E2 being calculated using the traditional um, vector form of an electric field. And then uh, we add them up using vectors and, uh, and basically we just resize it. Um, and so this little snippet of code actually took quite a great deal of time for uh, this team to build, right? The computer science kind of took, a, scientists took a first stab at it and then physicists came in and, and, um, and it really was, I think, the result of this very powerful collaboration where we had um, people on both teams kind of uh, bringing their talents to the table. So the Defy journey has actually um, mirrored the MyTech journey in a lot of ways. Um, we start by really identifying the problem, the, the common student misconceptions. From there, we um, take our student learning objectives and um, identify any instructional challenges that exist with, um, with current instructional aids. And then from that, we're able to sort of guide the development of the um, app, and in this case, um, any sort of accompanying activities that, that, might, um, that might go along with the app to help kind of guide students' learning. We did some early usability testing just for proof of concept to be sure that the app worked, that we were able, were able to deploy it to um, that many students in a given amount of time. And then we did some version 1.0 testing, and this is what we did literally just a week ago today. Um, and then from there, we were able to collect and analyze feedback. And then this, of course, is just gonna be sort of an iterative loop. So from there, we'll be able to revise the app, revise the curriculum, run the study again, and continue to analyze this feedback. And so you end up, like I say, with some sort of an iterative loop here. We're using React Native, um, which is, it has a, a great many advantages, um, not the least of which is that it's free, it's open source, um, and it is made for mobile apps. Um, it was created by Facebook, and, and it's basically a JavaScript library. React is a, a JavaScript library um, made for building user interfaces. And the native part of React Native means that um, we're able to basically pair 
um, pair our JavaScript libraries with the capabilities of uh, the mobile platforms that we're deploying it to. So uh, I want to just describe the design just a little bit and give you a sense of how it's changed um, in the online environment for those of you that might be running similar studies. Um, Basically, we wanted to divide the classroom into three chunks. We wanted to have a chunk that was using the tutorial treatment, so a basic pencil and paper worksheet, um, a group that was using a laptop simulation, and the group that was using the um, mobile app treatment. And we tested them before and after with some diagnostics to see how their understanding and attitudes changed um, as a result of those um, treatments. And then because we wanted to give all of the students exposure to all of the different treatments, um, they basically cycle through the, the other treatments, but that was not included in part of the study. So we did have to adapt this a little bit for the online environment. Um, basically class time no longer existed because the class was run asynchronously. And in our normal environment, we'd be using um, a scale up classroom. Scale up stands for a student centered active learning environment with upside down pedagogy. So it's a, it's a flipped classroom environment um, uh, developed by Bob Geekner as well out of NC State. And um, as you can see, uh, students are looking at each other. It is student centered in that way. It is not teacher focused. And there are whiteboards around the perimeter of the room and projector screens. And so if you're looking at this from kind of a bird's eye view, um, this is more or less what it looks like. There are 11 tables with nine seats at each table and the instructor and the learning assistant are able to, um, to migrate around the room accordingly. So we had initially planned on effectively dividing the group, uh, dividing the classroom roughly into three groups, uh, three, three sections, I should say, um, each given a, a different tutorial or a different treatment to test. Um, what we decided to do instead in our online environment is make use of the fact that the instructor had already assigned groups of three at each table. So um, this effectively divided the classroom into three separate chunks. There's a group A, a group B, and a group C at each table that we were able to assign to each treatment, even in the virtual classroom. So what this looked like was um, you know, these, these three students would then be assigned to each of these treatments, right, at, at any given table, even though these tables no longer physically exist. And they're all working independently, which is certainly a difference between the online and the physical realm on their own individual screens. And then, of course, there's um, many of them for each of the tables that we have, right? So, um, so all in all, we were able to get roughly even sample sizes from each of these treatments. We had um, roughly 22-ish students um, for each of the treatments. And this is hot off the presses data here, so um, forgive me um, for, for not having analyzed more of this. And, and this was um, very quickly analyzed by my student, Liana. Um, so we have her to thank for, for this awesome data. Um, but the average normalized gain by treatment, so a normalized gain basically just means how much did their performance shift from before having had the activity to after having had the activity. And we're normalizing it based on their incoming knowledge, so based on their, their pre-diagnostic score, their pre-activity diagnostic score. Um, and what we're seeing is, um, at a 20% confidence interval, um, a statistical significant difference between group A using the pencil and paper worksheet with groups B and C. Um, there is no statistical significant difference between groups B and C. What is interesting is that we did ask, um, after students had performed their, their, one, their very first treatment, um, if they had a preference in what type of activity they, they thought they might learn best with. And, um, these are counts of preferences, which is why it's not a pie chart, um, but we're giving students, um, so we're, we're allowing them to select multiple options here. Um, but the largest count uh, of preferences went to the laptop and, um, and John Barr um, hypothesized that perhaps this was because um, students are most familiar with it. And maybe there's some sort of cultural association with laptops and work that there isn't with um, smartphones and work or learning. We are hoping to run this over the course of the next couple of years. Um, again, it's kind of scaling up our evaluation, um, moving from, from one year to the next. So if you're at a school that's interested in trying this out, please let me know, because um, we are looking for volunteers and, and I do have IRB approval for all of this. So, um, so I, would, I would love to collect more data on this. 
We've experienced many challenges so far. Um, turns out drawing electric field lines is actually very tricky. <laughs> um, that's why there's not an equation for the shape of those lines, as far as I've seen. Um, there are just some practical challenges. Where do you start and stop drawing the lines? Um, how many points do you need in order to draw a line that's, that's somewhat meaningful. Um, it's very computationally expensive, right? I mean, even just to draw one line segment, you have to calculate a vector sum at each of those points. Um, and so it can be laggy on certain systems. And of course, the more charges you have, the more um, computationally expensive it will be. We also discovered some issues with um, different window sizes um, being somewhat of a challenge. And the fact that various members of our team were using slightly different terminologies for what was very often the same concept. And so, um, so just finding uh, kind of a common ground uh, in order to, to speak upon was uh, its own challenge. Uh, we're also using what's called an Expo client to deploy our apps to uh, mobile devices and that updated uh, various times throughout uh, our, our sort of heavy development phase and, um, and that was a bit of a challenge just uh, dealing with the updates from that. No doubt there will be more challenges to come, um, but there are things that we, uh, that we welcome. So I did just want to acknowledge um, you know, NC State's uh, Delta grants and all of the fantastic people I worked with in the Delta group um, that, that helped in the development of the MyTech app and getting that up and off the ground. And then um, more recently, Ithaca College's uh, startup funds and, um, and summer research funds that are helping to propel this, this whole thing forward. Uh, and the group that I'm working with is really just a dream team. So I'm very fortunate to be working with them. And at this point, I just sort of wanted to uh, open up to whatever questions uh, you guys might have for me. So thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen. Great, thanks. Um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, we have one right now. Um, Ethan sure. would like you to explain what an expert-like belief is. Oh, excellent, yeah. So um, it, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question. So the expert-like belief is, um, is related to the sea lasso. This is as defined by the um, Colorado Boulder folks who uh, developed the Colorado Learning uh, Attitudes um, about science survey, the sea lass. And what it did was the, um, in their, uh, my understanding is that in their survey validation process, they actually asked um, physicists for, to answer all of the same questions that they asked of, you know, their, their future participants in the study and basically looked for alignment in the participants' Um, responses with the experts' responses. And so, um, you know, people who are well-established in the physics community. Awesome, thank you. Um, sure. We have a question. If we wanted to provide feedback or help out, how would we do that? Oh, well, I would welcome it uh, with open arms. Um, shoot me an email. You can uh, just Google me, you know, at Ithaca College um, to get my most recent email. And um, I'd be happy to um, pass along uh, the information to access the app prototype um, and be able to share that easily and readily with your students. Um, and uh, that way we can move forward with that. Awesome. Uh, are there any other questions people can put in the chat? Give everybody a second. <laughs> sure, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, well, I think we are good then. Thank you Excellent. so much for your talk today. We all really enjoyed it. Um, Perfect. If people would like to see this talk again or share it with people they know, we will put it on our YouTube channel, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Michaela. I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Colleen, and we'll see you guys all later. All right, sounds good. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.